in my message this morning, I want to address this issue of, well, if God is good, why is there so much evil in the world? Now, as we look around the world today, and we're looking at COVID-19 and everything that's going on, people are asking this question, well, why so much evil? And even still, people are asking, well, if God is good, why does he allow pain and suffering in this world? Now, you have to admit, that's a great question. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but the world is filled with complicated questions. Questions such as, well, if carrots are good for your eyes, why do rabbits get hit by cars? I mean, why does Hawaii have an interstate highway? Why isn't phonetic spelled the way it sounds? And, um, you know, if money is the root of all evil, why do we collect it at church? Now, understand, it's the love of money, so please continue to give your offering. But if you follow me, the world is filled with complicated questions. And this question of why does a loving God, a good God, allow pain and suffering in the world? Well, that has to be one of the most toughest questions in the world for us to answer. C.S. Lewis said this issue of pain and suffering has to be the most troublesome question that there is. So this morning, I want to address that issue of why, if God is good, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? And this morning, to answer that question, I want you to consider these three things. I want you to think of the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I want to start out with the good. So what's good? Well, God is good. David says this in Psalms 106 and verse 1. It is, praise the Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Now, David repeats this theme over and over and over, this idea that God is good and his love, it endures forever. In other words, God's love, it never ends. But now let me ask you, when you look into the Old Testament, do you see God is good and his love never ends, or do you see a God of judgment and wrath? And can we be honest? Most people when they look at the God of the Old Testament and they start reading some of those stories, the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah and the 10 plagues of Egypt, they don't see God as good. They see judgment and wrath. And a lot of people in our world today, they see judgment and wrath and they hate God for it. For example, take Richard Dawkins. He happens to be the most famous atheist in all the world right now. And this man, he's at war with God. So much so, he wrote a book about it, and it's called The God Delusion. And here's what he says about God. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infantile, genocidal, megalomaniac, sadistic and a capricious malevolent bully now for somebody who doesn't believe in god he has an awful lot to say about god but do you see his picture of god for richard dawkins god is a god of judgment and wrath and he hates him for it and by the way charles darwin all he saw was a god of judgment and wrath and he became an evolutionist so let me ask you again when you get into the word of god do you see that God is good, or do you see a God of judgment and wrath? Now here's the thing. How is it that David could repeatedly say, now by the way, David had been judged by God. David had come under the judgment of God, and still he wrote, God is good, his love endures forever. So you've got to ask, how in the world could David, who lived in the Old Testament, could say that about God? Well, here's what you need to know. The God of the Old Testament, it's none other than Jesus Christ. Now, why would I say that? Well, take your Bibles. You could turn to Colossians. It's 1 and 16. And this is what we read. Speaking of Jesus, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now, if you add to that, 1 John chapter 1, and John begins with, well, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now those words, in the beginning, well, that takes us back to Genesis chapter 1. And you could read Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 as, in the beginning, Jesus created the heavens and the earth. 
Now, why would I say that? Well, because 1 Colossians 1.16 just told us Jesus created everything. John would go on to say in John chapter 1 that Jesus created everything, and without Jesus, nothing was created. So you see, when Adam woke up, when he saw the face of his creator, that face was Jesus. When Abraham met God in the wilderness, that God, it was Jesus. And when Moses comes to the burning bush and God says to him, I am that I am, that same God, 2,000 years later, would look at a group of people and say, before Abraham was, I am. The God of the Old Testament is none other than Jesus Christ. So now let me ask you, when you look at the life of Jesus Christ, do you see that God is good or do you see judgment and wrath? I want you to think about the teachings of Jesus. Love your enemy. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Turn the other cheek. Forgive those who do you wrong. Does that sound like judgment and wrath to you? When you look at the cross and you see Jesus hanging there, dying for our sins, and he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you see judgment and wrath, or do you hear that God is good and his love never ends? The reason David could write what he wrote is because Jesus is the God of the Old Testament and God is good and his love never ends. Now I know, some of you, you're listening to me right now and you're thinking to yourselves, okay, but Pastor Bob, what about stories like the flood? I mean, you've got to admit, that looks like a lot of judgment and wrath to me. So I want you to think about this. You see, when some people look at the flood, that's exactly what they see. They see judgment, they see wrath. Let me tell you what I see. I see judgment and I see salvation. Now why would I say that? Because of the ark. I mean, think about this. If God's intent was to punish people and wipe them off the face of the earth, then why the ark? Why is it that for 120 years Noah preached salvation? Noah's message was, a flood is coming, I'm building an ark, God wants to save you. God's intent was not to destroy humanity, but to save it. Now let me ask you, did God judge the world? Absolutely. But what you need to know about God's judgment is that God judges and that he always provides a way of escape. He always provides salvation. So if you're wondering if COVID-19 is an act of God, let me ask you, was there a warning? And was there a way of escape? Because this pattern exists in Scripture. Take Nineveh. God sends Jonah. There's a warning and there's a way of escape. God has this pattern throughout all of Scripture. Why? Because when it comes to judgment, God always prefers mercy. So here's what you need to know about the flood. Nobody had to die. Absolutely nobody had to die. Noah had preached salvation and a way of escape for 120 years, and he built an ark so that everybody could escape the flood. You see, God can judge the world, but he always provides a method of salvation because God is not a death dealer. God is not into wrath. God judges, and then he provides a way of escape, which is why we're told, for God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus. God judged the world. It was in sin, and it needed saving. And so he sent Christ not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So friend, if you find at some point in your life that you're not saved, and you've come under the judgment of God, and you're lost, understand you won't be lost because God wanted you to be lost. You'll be lost because God judged you, and you refused his way of escape. You refused his salvation. You see, this is what you need to know. God is good, and his love endures forever. And God always prefers mercy over judgment. And so again, nobody had to die. And the sad part about the final judgment will be this. In the end, we will discover, because of God's grace and his love and his mercy, nobody, nobody had to die. Because in Jesus, we all have a way of escape because God is good and his love endures forever. So if God is good, what's the bad? Well, Satan is bad. 
I mean, you learned this in Cradle Roll. I mean, it's Cradle Roll 101. God is good, Satan is bad. This is the formula. God good, Satan bad. But here's the problem. I don't think people realize just how bad the devil is. Take a look at this. It's from Revelation. It's Revelation 12 and 12. And in it we read, For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. Now, if you're a note taker, you see that word for woe? This is the strongest possible word they can find in Scripture to communicate pain and suffering and sorrow. It's the one, if you could take pain, suffering, and sorrow and give it one word, it would be this word, woe. So if you're a note taker, write this down next to this word in your Bible. It's the Bible's way of saying, watch out, this is going to be really bad. So why would the Bible say that about Satan? Well, it comes from Jesus. This is what Jesus had to say about Satan. Speaking of the devil, in John 10 and 10, Jesus said, The thief only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that you may have life, and life more abundantly. Don't miss this. Woe to the earth, because Satan has come down in great wrath, and this thief, he has come to kill, he has come to steal, and he has come to destroy. But God is good because he has come to give you life and life more abundantly. So God is good and Satan is bad. But have you ever noticed that we have a tendency to kind of blame God for things that maybe the devil has done? I mean, if you took Satan out of the equation, what would you do with all of the evil in the world? I mean, how would you explain the rape? How would you explain murder? genocide, war, diseases, pestilences, famines, and earthquakes. If there were no devil, how would you explain everything that is wrong with this world? Well, maybe you would blame God. They did a survey across North America, and they asked people this question. They asked, do you believe in God? And 90% of Americans said in some way, shape, or form, they believed there was a God. But then the same group of people said, well, um, when it came to the question of whether or not they believed there was a devil, only 30% of the uh, participants said they believed that there was a devil. So if you don't believe in a devil but you believe in God, and something goes wrong in this world, who are you going to blame? Well, you're not going to blame the devil. You don't believe he exists. So who do you blame? We blame God. And we've been doing it for thousands of years. For example, if your home were destroyed by an earthquake, a flood, or a tornado, what, do you, what does an insurance agency call that? Well, we call that an act of God, right? I mean, because for thousands of years, we've been blaming God for the things that have been going on around us. And the same thing happens in Scripture. For example, take Job. I talked about Job a couple of weeks ago. Now, if you know his story, um, I want to give you a little quiz. Did Job's children, all seven of them, die in one day? Yes or no? And yes, they did. And one day, did Job lose all of his flocks and all of his servants, or the majority of them? Yes, he did. And one day, Job was financially ruined. Did, was Job afflicted by boils and painful sores? Yes, he was. I mean, think about this. I mean, he loses all of his kids. I mean, to lose one kid is bad enough, but he loses all seven of them in a day. The next day, he's financially ruined, and then the next thing he knows, he's afflicted by sores and boils. And what do the people around him think? Who are they blaming for this? Well, his wife. Who did she think did this to Job? Well, she thought God had. Job, curse God and die. Just get it over with. Job's three best friends, who did they think had done this to Job? Well, they thought God was doing it to Job. Job, you've done something wrong. God's punishing you. Job, you need to get right with God. But now let me ask you, who did Job think was doing this to Job? And Job also thought that God had been doing this to Job. But now let me ask you, if you read the story, who did this to Job? Satan had done this to Job. Woe to the earth because Satan has come down in great wrath and he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And in the story of Job, this was not done by God. God had not judged Job. 
He had not condemned Job. Satan had condemned Job, and Satan had moved against this man. You see, God does not deal in death and destruction. Satan does. But how often do we blame the Lord for the work of Satan? So you see, in Scripture, Scripture is clear. It is Satan who comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. God comes, and he always gives a way of escape. But now as a parent, you should know the truth of this. I don't know about you, but there are times when my kids get on my nerves. I mean, my kids, they know how to press my buttons and they know how to bug me. And so there were times when I would say to my kids, okay, I'm giving you a warning. That's enough. Knock it off. Stop it. And then I would count to three. So if my kids got on my nerves, I would say, that's enough. And then if they would act up again, I would go, that's one. Now, let me tell you something. I never made it past two because my kids were afraid of if dad ever got to three, they didn't know what would happen, but they knew it would be unpleasant. So one day I'm driving down the road and my kids, well, Caitlin's 17, Justin's 14, and they're bugging each other. So much so it's getting on my nerves and I tell them to stop it. Well, they didn't stop it. And I said again, listen, you two, don't make me come back there. And that got silence and peace for about five minutes. And then they started acting up. And that's when I said, that's one. Now, their mother and my wife at the time looked at me and said, Bob, really? You think, you know, Caitlin's 17. Do you really think that still works with her? And Caitlin from the back seat of the car went, oh, mom, yeah, it still works with me. But now let me ask you, why was I like that? Well, like any healthy parent, I wasn't trying to destroy my kids. I didn't want to punish them. I wanted to redeem them. I wanted to provide them a way out so that they could redeem themselves. And here's what you need to know. 2,000 years ago, God had judged the world. We were in need of saving. And God wanted to provide us with a way out. So what does he do? He loves the world. And so he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that we don't have to. And so today, understand, yes, all of us sin, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person on the face of the planet has been judged guilty. But God has provided us with a way of escape because God prefers mercy over judgment. No healthy parent in the universe, let alone on this world, no healthy parent would ever want to destroy their kids as a punishment. What do we do? We give them discipline, we give them correction, because we want to redeem them. And God, because he's good and his love endures forever, God brings a way of escape, and it's through Jesus Christ. So if you're finding yourself in a situation of destruction, if you're finding yourself in a situation of pain and suffering, Understand, God's not doing that. God didn't come down in great wrath. Satan did. You see, God's good, and Satan's bad, and woe to the earth, and woe to all of us, because Satan has come down. And he came down in wrath, and Jesus, he also came down, but he brought life and salvation and a way of escape. And I praise God that God is good, and the devil, well, he's bad. So we know God's good. We know the devil is bad. So what's the ugly? And what's ugly? It's you and me. Now where do I get that from? Well, I said it earlier. All of us have sinned, and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, who on this planet has not given in to the dark side? I mean, who on this planet has at some point in their life not given in to pain and anger and prejudice and jealousy and gossip and lying and stealing? I mean, just look at our planet. We, as a human race, have given in to evil. And there are times in life, well, we cooperate with it. You see, here's what God has given us. God gave us free choice. God has given us free will. And what human beings have a tendency to do because of sin is to use our free will to hurt other human beings. You see, it's not God and it's not Satan who rapes other human beings. Human beings rape other human beings. It's human beings who murder other human beings. 
It's human beings who commit acts of war, acts of genocide. It's human beings engaged in human trafficking and corporate greed. Everything that's wrong with this world, in part or most part, has to do with the fact that we human beings are using our free will to inflict pain and suffering on other human beings. It's not God who's allowed the pain and suffering. We have, because all too often, we align our free will with evil. For example... Joseph Stalin, he killed 20 million of his own people. But do you think he personally killed all those people? No, he did not. Stalin had people around him who, in cooperation with himself, butchered 20 million of their own people. Adolf Hitler murdered, butchered some 6 to 10 million individuals. Do you think Hitler did that all by himself? Absolutely not. Other human beings working in cooperation with these evil men butchered other human beings. God didn't do that. And to be honest, Satan didn't do that. We did that because human beings took their free will and inflicted pain and suffering on other human beings because we chose to cooperate with evil. Back in the 80s, the name Pablo Escobar was a household name in North America. Pablo Escobar was the head of the Colombian drug cartel. He was a powerful, brutal, and vicious man. I mean, his drug organization brought in some $3 billion a year. He had power. And the United States of America, their law enforcement association, they labeled, they identified Pablo Escobar as the most vile and evil human being in all of human history. Now think about that. We've had a lot of evil people down through history, and law enforcement in the United States said out of all the evil people, he's the worst. Now here's why they said that. One day he had his men shoot down an airliner filled with 109 passengers, and he had them shoot it down because he thought the president of Colombia was on that plane. Of the 24 justices sitting on the Supreme Court down in Colombia, He personally had 11 of them assassinated. He had over 200 members of the clergy assassinated. There would be pastors, there would be preachers who would cry out against the drug cartels and then Pablo Escobar would send his men to kick down the doors of the church. Those men would walk up to the pastor and they would shoot him right in the head in front of his family and his church. Pablo Escobar cared nothing about anybody but himself. Now here's where this story gets weird. He ran for office. He ran to be a congressman in the Congress of Colombia. And you know what? He won. And he didn't win by a margin, he won by a landslide. Now you have to ask yourself, how it was this evil, vile human being, this butcher, this man who was responsible for the rape, the death, and the mutilation of hundreds of people, not including the lives he destroyed through drugs, How is it that this man could make it into politics? Because human beings used their free will to cooperate with evil. And you see, this is why we all need salvation. Because at some point in life, all of us cooperate with evil, whether we want to admit it or not. So 2,000 years ago, God judged the world. And he judged it, and he said, it needs saving. That's God's judgment. God judged us as being in need of salvation. So Jesus comes because God loved the world. He loved you. He loved me. And he came so that we could live. And he died so that we wouldn't have to. And that salvation he offers you and me not only frees us from sin, forgives our sin, but it gives us a new life. So much so that I'm no longer cooperating with evil but I'm operating in love. They said back in the early 1990s, Colombia, I mean, sorry, it was Cambodia. Cambodia was experiencing a revival. I mean, hundreds of people were being saved and they were getting baptized. And when we asked the pastors over there, what was the source, what was the cause of all this revival, they told us that the greatest tool they had for evangelism and saving souls was water baptism. And we were thinking, really? Water baptism? That's your greatest tool for the gospel? But here's what went on. You see, back in the 70s, Pol Pot became the leader of Cambodia. And in his regime, 
he and his men had butchered some two million of their own people. Well, Pol Pot's regime fell. And these soldiers, well, they were re released back into civilian life. And these men were faced with what they had done. These men were haunted by the faces of those they had raped and they had butchered. And they were guilty. And they knew it. And they were suffering shame. They were suffering from guilt. They fell into depression. Many of them were committing suicide. Others had gone into alcohol and drugs because they were trying to end the pain of their guilt. And then they heard the gospel. They heard the gospel of salvation and they learned that Jesus Christ had died for their sins and if they would give, him them, if they would give their life to Jesus and be baptized, they could find the washing away of their sins in the baptismal waters and they would be raised to a new life free from the guilt and the shame of every sinful act, every evil act that they had committed. So friend, here we are. It's COVID-19. And right now there are people, and you're lonely and you're hurting, and there's pain and suffering. And let's face it, people are dying. And there are people who are asking right now, if God is good, why is he allowing all this pain and suffering? And, and there's some people who are even saying, this is God's judgment on the world. And friend, let me tell you, it is not. If there's pain and suffering in this world, God's not allowing it. We are because we are ugly. All of us have sinned, and we're the ones who use our free will to inflict and allow pain and suffering in the lives of those around us. But you see, God is good, and God has judged us as a need of salvation, so he sent us Jesus so that right now you don't have to cooperate with evil. Whatever it is you're doing right now that you know is wrong, anytime right now you're using and you're tempted to use your free will to hurt another human being, understand you don't have to live that way. Like those soldiers in Cambodia you do not have to continue to live with the guilt and the pain and the shame of your life and the things that you have done. Today, God is offering you salvation. And he's saying, I know, I know you've done some ugly things, but Jesus can forgive your sin and he can set you free. So much so, that you're not cooperating with evil, but you're moving in love. So here's what I know. There's pain and suffering in this world. And I know that God is good. I know the devil is bad. And I get it. Me, like everybody else on this planet, I can be ugly. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life to Jesus. I've done that. I've given my life to Jesus. And I want to invite you to do the same. And I'm going to ask God today to take everything in me that is ugly. I want him to judge it. And then I want him to put it on a cross. I want to ask him to crucify my sin. I'm going to ask him to wash me and cleanse me and then make me new. So much so that I'm going to use my free will to love you. So friend, you have the good. You have the bad. But whether or not you stay ugly, that's up to you. So I'm going to ask you today, take it and give it to Jesus. Let him set you free. And then use that free will to love and to bless each other. God is good. His love endures forever. And I want that for you. Amen.